We've been fighting a long time. We have all lost so very much. So many loved ones gone. But you are not alone. There are pockets of resistance all around the planet. We are at the brink. You have no idea how important you are. If you're listening to this, you are the resistance. Ave Maricela Dei Mater Alma Ad Semper Virgo Felix Semporta And welcome everybody, with Steve with Sense Fidelium coming at you with a book review that we've kind of started doing in the last couple episodes. This time, the Catechism Explained of Father Sparagno. We're doing this with Father Ripperger, who you've probably heard his name once or twice on the program. And Ryan Grant. Again, shouldn't be a stranger to anybody who's a fan of the channel. Father, Ryan, welcome. Thank you. Thanks Thanks for having me. So, Father, right to you on this one. Father, you've done a couple lectures and mentioned or recommended the book itself in a and A, I think it was quite a few times why this catechism in particular well I think there's a couple of reasons um, <clears throat> the primary reason is, is because of the fact that it's it's a catechism that's accents, accessible to your average layman um, it's based upon the catechism of the Council of Trent if I'm not mistaken so it's it takes the catechism of the Council of Trent and then it's explained which means it gives a lot uh, more detail so you have different parts where there's the the basic part of the catechism and then there's an additional explanations that people can read and so it's i always considered it a great reference and a great source for just basic knowledge of the what the church teaches but then also to provide um, a traditional understanding of how this stuff was understood in the past and so and the clarity of it so it's you know just the basics that a, a catechism should have at hand Ryan, um, you put this book together. You've been talking about this for months, maybe over a year now. What drew you to this catechism itself? Well, some of the same things that Father just mentioned, and also that um, I liked how a lot of the examples, there were one or two places of some dated language, and I updated it a little bit for the reprint. Um, in dated language in terms of like physical thing, what you call things and language type of issues. But outside of that, there was only about three or four instances of that in the in the general uh, nature of it. Every doctrine is explained, you know, with uh, I guess the precision of a well-educated layman in terms of like the way it's explained for you. It's not this, you know, complicated treatise. It's not something that's going to be above most people's heads. And I look at the size of the book and say, oh, wow, I don't know about that. But in reality, we read it it's very simple, it's easy to follow. Copious references to the Church Fathers, to the Scholastics, um, you know, and, and so it stays popular in terms of the popular writing level without being a complicated treatise, but at the same time, it really gets everything the faithful really need to know about uh, catechetical doctrine. And uh, plus, it's one of those books that I had seen, I try to look out for things like there were people are looking for a new edition of it because no one's publishing it and it's just kind of like the facsimile reprints that are on Amazon that are sometimes hard to read or the text is really small. So when I see things like that, I say, oh, look, there, well, there's an angle. There's a book that at least, at least could pay for itself if nothing else. So uh, it's really, and plus benefit people spiritually. So let's go ahead and get that. And that, that's what kind of got me to do it and uh, struggle through all the aggravations and annoyances of getting a full reprint on a thousand page book. Yeah, because you have, uh, this will be your third catechism on Mediatrix Press, along with uh, Bellarmine's and the little catechism of, uh, I, I just went stupid. What, St. Peter Canisius. St. Peter. What, now, besides the size, what would be the big differences, differences between the three? I guess the differences between them would be, because they're all they're all similar in as much as they get so the small catechism really gives points in a short explanation uh bellerman's catechism is a dialogue right so it's it's his longer catechism because there's also a short one and as a dialogue he's meaning it for people who would teach catechism and uh and bellerman was a really good catechist in fact when he was a bishop he worked really hard to get the catechetical knowledge up and he would but he knew the country people would um you know be suspicious because so many 
Agus priests and just uh, that is bad priests that went around. Nobody was supporting him, so they went around getting money however they could. So they would just take some bread, do some big Latin over it, and say, "Oh, look, see, I did the mass. Now pay me." And because Bellarmine knew people were really weary about priests coming through to preach for that reason, he would actually hire priests and pay all their wages and say, "Now go teach catechism and don't charge anybody a dime. Here, here's this and this and this." And so, and, and the, the one that was a tool actually for to train lay people to who could read to uh, in order to deal with and manage a classroom, a catechism and whatnot. So that's kind of the, the focus of Bellarmine's catechism. And this one, um, it's exhaustive. And so, so all those catechisms are basically to, you know, for the, the basic points of doctrine in their day. This is meant more to be, you know, like its title says, it's, it's trying to embrace everything. And so, but do so simply and accurately, along, as well as giving anecdotes, which are really enjoyable to read, as well as enlightening to the mind that elucidate the point of catechism it's talking about. And, you know, so it's useful for teachers, it's useful for adults who are trying to learn more about the faith, it's used, you know, that don't have like the theological training that they might want to have to crack, you know, more serious and difficult books. And so, uh, so that that's, I guess, the key difference. I mean, it is somewhat in the size and as much as it is trying to embrace everything rather than merely just their father and the creed and whatnot, even though it still follows that kind of organization. Of that. Father, the catechism <laughs> itself, why is this even important to even have? I mean, the catechism of Trent, uh, if I'm correct, it's that was for priests. And there's all kinds of catechisms throughout time, uh, like Tradivox is coming out with all these old school ones that they're reprinting uh, by different priests for different areas for different times of the, uh, history, basically. Why is it important for a laity right. to even have a catechism to make sure it's the right one and then study it, obviously? Well, I think there's a um, couple of reasons. You know, when you look at um, Historically, especially in the last 100 and 125 years, there's been a collapse of catechesis, especially, well, actually since Vatican II more than anything. Because up until the Second Vatican Council, at least in this country, the catechesis was actually fairly decent, and the catechisms that were used were pretty, pretty clear, actually, in their expression of the faith. And I think that the Roman catechism, you know, originally one of the titles to the Roman catechism, which um, is actually the catechism of the Council of Trent was referred to as, um, the Roman Catechism was also the universal catechism in the sense of that it was the one that pretty much covered all the basics of the faith. It covered all those things that were necessary for people to actually know. And so when I look at the, um, the, the aspect of this particular catechism, which I think is useful for the laity, is uh, there's a few things. One is, as we've talked about, the precision, as Ryan mentioned as well, the clarity the fact that it covers all the document, the, the doctrines that are necessary for people to actually know, it's a great reference tool because it is so extensive that they can just go and look up a particular thing and actually get a sense of it. Um, and in a sense, because it's a universal catechism, it kind of it it was the one in which was sent out to the universal church. So as a result of that, it was considered a, kind of a standard. Um, this is a standard in the sense of it was it was considered almost like a rule of faith, not in the same sense of say, the fathers of the church or things like that, or say uh, specific magisterial documents, but it was considered to have expressed the faith in such a fashion that if you read it, you knew that you believed rightly. If you gave assent to those things, you believed rightly about what the church was actually teaching. I think that's one of the beauties of the, of the catechism is that, you know, when, the um, when a person who has a strong faith, um, and by strong I mean in the sense of that they believe what the church believes and they desire to understand that uh, what the church believes, when you read a catechism that expresses the faith clearly, one experiences a certain delight in actually just reading it. Even if you, even someone like myself who's been studying philosophy and theology for over thirty years, once you get to the um, uh, 35 years going on now, actually a little bit more than that even. But the point being is, is that once you get to the, uh, when you read that, St. Thomas observes that when it comes to an act of, of, of the virtue, when a person has a certain virtue and a specific faculty, when you perform the act that pertains to that faculty um, uh, that is in accord with the virtue that the faculty actually has, there's a delight that the faculty enjoys in that act itself. This is one of the reasons why people who have the faith and read a catechism that's clear 
there's a certain delightfulness in just the, reading the expression of it. Whereas the people who don't have the faith, especially in the case of the of the modernism, that's it. when they read this stuff, there's a dissonance that occurs intellectually in relationship to the thing. And as a result, they don't like the precision or they don't like the expression or they don't like the doctrine, period. Whereas this this catechism, I think, provides kind of a, a basis for a standard. That's why I tell people, look, if you need to know what you need to believe as a Catholic, there's the standard. Just go and read this. You know, in other words, if you're looking for a rule of faith, it's not an official rule of faith in one sense, in the sense of the church says, this is what you must believe. But it is an official rule of faith in the sense that it was officially promulgated by the Vatican uh, as a catechism, to, which was sent to the clergy so that they could conform their preaching to that. And so it did become kind of a standard. And so I think that's why this particular catechism is uh, very helpful for the laity because it provides a standard or a reference to, if I want to know what I need to believe, if I want to know what the church teaches, I'll just go read this, at least about the essential doctrines that the church teaches. Yeah, I remember looking at it a few years ago. It's during the Colby conference that we both were at. I was in the back just scanning through it. I'd never heard of it until one of your lectures, and I was just curious. It was just the marriage part was bam, 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 bam. There were so many subtitles, and here's this, and... I was blown away with that. Ryan, what was something that you read in the catechism that you went, wow, I mean, I'd never seen this in others. Uh, this this makes this very significant. I hope other people see this and, you know. One of the things that, uh, that really stuck out to me um, was the certain things that he would take the time, like communism, for example, was very strongly condemned. And this book is written before um, 1917, before the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. And he's still you know, condemning all the, the ills of communism. And then the, the things that he describes would happen, what's exactly what you see in Russia and every, every other place where, where communism was able to take root and take off. So, I mean, that, that was one of the, those things. But the other is just, um, I can't think of one specific one, but um, you know, the way in which he, he would make use of various quotes from, you know, citations from St. Augustine or St. Basil the Great or others that just, it's so completely, uh, you know, would conform, you know, the the teaching on this or that given heading, um, you know, all of the, the way those worked. I mean, it just I kept finding things that stood out and just said, "Wow, that that's really impressive." Father, was any was there any like that in for you? Uh, not the first time I looked at it. I mean, the first time I looked at it, I was just impressed at how extensive it was and how clear it was, and also as I mentioned, the various levels of the way in which it addresses certain topics. Recently, I was kind of uh, interested to see what they had to say about the souls in purgatory, and it was actually, you know, very clear. It's it's very well done in that respect. Yeah, I kind of figured out if all the catechisms and books you read, I'd probably didn't surprise you, and you just knew it was good. Right. <laughs> Ryan, um, first off, there's a promo code for Sense of Fidelium if you type it in in the uh, checkout box for 15% off. Uh, the link will be below in the show notes of this video. So everyone go over there, check out the, check out the website, hit the code, get the book for you and a friend or a seminary, maybe. Uh, what <laughs> what made you put the uh, the uh, cover that you have on? What, what was the inspiration to go with that? Covers are always complicated because I don't have extensive graphic design skills and I don't, uh, my drawing um, is not... Uh, terribly more advanced than stick figures, uh, to be honest. So, you know, I looked at, uh, and then the paying for that is very expensive. So, you know, so I always hit Renaissance art. One, because an, I'm an amateur art historian and I, I love art history. And I usually get a sense of like, okay, these types of pieces of artwork will work very nicely. And so I can start looking at them and playing with the ideas for the for the cover. So with this one, so I mean, the idea, what's the nature of the book? Well, it's teaching you know, the faith, the faithful, it's giving the basis for preaching. So, you know, so a couple of things came to mind and I settled on uh, Raphael's, um, you know, Paul preaching in Athens, because here's Paul trying to evangelize the uh, the nations to bring, you know, the, the, the gospel to the nations, not say, um, well, hey, you worship your gods, we'll worship our gods and, and I'll, um, and have little olive plants here, you know, type of thing. It's, it's rather, um, you know, he, he's exhorting them to ex to embrace Christ, which is, you know, 
and then once you've done that, you need you know more teaching, more pre you know, preaching, etc. So looking at those types of things, I, I kind of settled on that um, you know the, the, the Raphael's Paul in Athens. JP two wrote a uh, document authorizing the new catechism where he said that it is to be used in conjunction with other catechisms. Just in case someone comes out and says, oh, well, we got the new, the CCC, we don't need this. What would be your reaction or response to that? Yeah, I believe, unless I'm mistaken, it was Catechesi Tridende uh, that uh, St. John Paul II had written that this cat, you know, the, that this catechism can also be used in conjunction with many others, even explicitly names the Roman catechism in there. So that at least, you know, judging by what he had said there, um, it wasn't, you know, the late uh, Pope's mind to uh, wipe away every catechism, to say, oh, no, these don't exist anymore, only this big, giant, massive book that we've had to correct 10 times. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was rather meant to be a working document to draw all these various points in order, as it were, and, you know, give, um, you know, and maybe update certain things in discussion they felt need to be updated, what have you, right? But it was never meant to replace, you know, because immediately, too, they started you know, working in different books and different catechisms to, to make use of, because you can't give a book like that to a seven-year-old child and say, all right, memorize this and learn this. So, right, and so then there's different uses for different types of catechisms. So it, as we already noted with the three different ones that I publish or various ones that have been published over the ages, there's there's like a set purpose to it. And that, that's what I think really John Paul II was getting at with that is you can't, you know, we're not wiping the slate clean where you know you use other ones in conjunction especially so if you're looking at it it's like well this is a little more more clear than the you know the new one might have been made to address this point but this one actually has it more clearly than i would assume the late pope would say then use that one father can you add you know, on to that yeah i was just gonna say you know when i was at the, when i was in the seminary um i was taught by the late uh, monsignor eugene caban who was um probably one of the best, um, one of the most knowledgeable people about catechesis in the United States during the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And he had made the observation, he was one of the guys that taught me a lot about modernism, but he said that he, he said that the Roman catechism, actually all subsequent catechisms would always be judged in light of the Roman catechism because the Roman catechism is the uh, expression of faith. It's the totality of the faith taken down and expressed and then passed on so that all the subsequent catechisms um, would never fully supplant that catechism. Now, I realize on a practical level that a lot of people look at the catechism put out by John Paul II, um, Catechism of the Catholic Church, as supplanting that, but that's actually not what's happening. But it's, and that's why it has to be taken in conjunction with it, because ultimately, the Roman Catechism is the—it's an expression of the faith, and so that, that the faith doesn't change, and so anything that's going to come subsequent to that would actually always have to be read at least in some, to some degree in light of that particular catechism, if you're looking at it from the point of view of just as a basic catechetical text explicating the faith. So I think that it it has to be understood. It's kind of—it's very similar to some of the observations I've made in the past where. Really, what's going, what the church teaches now has to be understood in, um, you know, you judge it in light of the tradition. It's the same thing here. All subsequent catechisms to the Roman Catechism would always be judged in light of the Roman Catechism. And that's one of the reasons why this book is very um, useful for the laity because they have, in a certain sense, because it can basically contains the Roman Catechism plus and, and additional explanations. And so it's a, it's a valuable resource in that sense of knowing this is what the church teaches regardless of whatever the subsequent catechism said and also even in relationship to the catechism of the catholic church uh if there's any areas of lack of clarity in that particular catechism we would we would bring the clarity from the roman catechism to that particular uh catechism as well do we know who father spragno was it's in the preface to the i believe one of the prefaces in the book but um, yeah, but he was a uh, religious priest, uh, late 19th century, um, that uh, is an experienced catechist. Um, I don't know much more about him. I was, hoping, I, was hoping Ryan would, <laughs> I was hoping Ryan would be able to answer that question because he's the better historian. Yeah, <laughs> yeah by the book is in the preface. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I might have looked at it before um, 
probably when I was looking at it when I made the decision to reprint it, but I probably didn't look too much further than that. So if I could, I just did want to say a few things about the edition because um, it is a reprint. It's not a facsimile. It's actually you know completely retype set. And so one of the things uh, that I noticed in the, at least the original that I had, I don't know about a subsequent edition, but um, I had uh, seen there, there's some places where the, the heading would be in bold and other places where it wasn't. And then numbers that sometimes you have more numbers with, and sub, the subheadings in it, it, it was it sometimes became confusing what number you were following. So I, I came up with, um, I simplified that, you know, changed where it would go one and then it would go to like one, two, three, four, five, and then two, and then you know, you're like, well, and you get lost in it all. So I changed it to, to letters in the subheadings to make that a little more clear so you know exactly which point you're following. And then I increased the size of the text. I think it was nine and 10 point in the original. I made it 11 and 12 point. So uh, to sort of help uh, a little easier on the eyes that way. <laughs> Were there any pictures in the, in the original too? <laughs> no, there weren't actually. Um, at least not the scan that I used to to make mine. It um, I thought about it, and then I said, uh, you know, they're going to be black and white anyway, and uh, it, you, you might the, the amount of work I'd have to to get them the right resolution and, and lightness and like for this kind of text, it's like eh, it's not really necessary. It's not like we're giving to kids. We need them to have things to little kids and then you had needed things to look at. You know, something you're going to use to teach your kids. Yeah. So. Yeah, I saw one from uh, Bellman's English Catechism. If you if you take the word coverings out, it's like two pages. But he put word coverings in everything, and it ended up being like 20, 30 pages because of it. Well, he didn't actually do it, but it was oh. um, those were actually the English recusants um, in the 1620s that did that in their printers. They actually, which actually is a complicated process because you get the wood engravers, and they actually have to literally, they'd have an image on paper, and then they'd have to actually basically sculpt it and engrave it in the wood and then that became the plate that would be used for the printing set setup which of course looks like a big wine press you know print this thing it would come down on the wood cut that you just splashed with the ink and that's how you get that uh and so they had all those types of images that they had used in uh in, you know the catechism because it was also meant for kids and that's why they made the pictures with the various symbols and, and signs that are in them that were common and known to be and could be explained to, to children, this is the, you know, means this, this means baptism. You have all the different, you know, things so that they would be impressed upon uh, the child's mind what this is as an extra thing, which is very powerful in an age where you do not have television, let alone computers. That makes sense. <laughs> Father, any final thoughts on the catechism itself? Um, not particularly, not that other than I would, I would hope that people would, um, as I said in my conferences, my hope is that people would actually pur purchase the book, if for no other reason than to have it on the shelf as a standard for which even even whether they or their children can actually make use of it. So, Ryan? Um, I, I obviously am a bit uh, biased in, in terms of <laughs> saying you should buy the book. <laughs> buy in bulk. Um, that's right, buy in bulk. Buy bulk. I, would, I would put in that... Um, hardcover orders. I have a shipment coming in at the end of the week. They actually got un unexpectedly a lot of interest last week and sold a bunch of them out. So I had to, <clears throat> so I have more that are coming, just not fast enough. So they will be here later in the week. And it is available in soft and hard hardcover, right? Right. Is it available on eBooks or? Uh, uh, on Kindle, Kindle. And I'm working on getting on iBooks. So we have the paperback uh, edition and then the hardcover, which is a dust jacket, nicer edition. and anyway very nice well, appreciate you guys uh, again at the bottom of the screen will be the link uh, click it type in census fidelium you got to spell it right 15 percent off it's all spelled out entirely uh i'll give you the cheat code at the bottom too so you can just copy and paste it in uh but thank you guys for being here father as always could you give a final blessing yes benedicto de omnipotentis patris et fili et spiritus et money et semper amen Thank you, guys. Okay. God bless. God bless. Introducing the Catechism Explained by Father Spirago, now with a foreword from Father Ripperger. This catechism aims at cultivating all the three powers of the soul, the intellect, the emotions, and the will. For a limited time, use coupon code Census Fidelium and save 15% on this masterpiece. Available now at MediatrixPress.com.